Okay, Matthew 18, 10 through 14. Jesus says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search for the, of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. About a month ago, I saw one. I saw a seminary president online. He was very happy that the seminary that he was president over, uh, we're in Matthew 18, 10 through 14. Uh, this seminary president was very happy to announce the lineup of chapel speakers they had for the fall semester. And he made the comment in announcing these uh, speakers that he was deeply honored to have many of the nation's, quote, leading pastors coming to speak. In response, someone asked him, what exactly do you mean by leading pastors? A year ago, a friend of mine who pastors in another state called me chuckling and he said, I overheard a pastor speaking about someone else and he said, this person is a high impact leader high impact leader. So now, whenever my friend and I speak to each other, I say, how are you? Are you being a high impact leader in your church? Here recently, I heard some large, larger church pastors speaking of another pastor, and they pointed out on two different occasions that he was the pastor of a very small church, and one of them referred to him as, quote, unsophisticated. High impact leader, leading pastor, sophisticated. What is it about this that makes us very uneasy? I mean, if you hear that charitably, I guess it's a kind of compliment. Maybe it's just a way of saying these people they're talking about are good leaders. But there's something that raises a caution flag about all of this. And I think it has to do with how Jesus spoke about the kingdom. Jesus did not seem to use that kind of language, and he did not seem to recommend that kind of language. And whenever, in fact, he encountered people that were high impact, sophisticated, or larger church pastors, leading pastors, he seemed to almost always be in conflict with them. Now, earlier in Matthew 18, Jesus brought a child and put, them, put him before the disciples and said, when they asked, who is the highest impact leader among us? He said, you must become like a little child. He seems to continue that theme in Matthew 18.10, but I want us to consider carefully what exactly he's saying here. So just hear this once again. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray? Does he not leave the ninety nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Jesus did not traffic in the language of high impact, sophisticated, big church, and leading. He trafficked in the language of mustard seed, become like a child, and diminutive language. What's happening here? I want to suggest a few things. First of all, do not look down on the humble Christian. Do not look down on the humble Christian. Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Now, verse 10 gives us two different statements. They're connected, obviously, in a single thought, but 
First, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Secondly, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, in keeping with what Jesus said earlier in Matthew 18, many people believe that he's returning to and continuing the theme of the literal child that he put in their midst. But do keep in mind that the point of the literal child that he points to is to establish that this is what all believers should be like. We should all be be like the little child. So actually, in the interpretation, the history of the interpretation of this passage, there's been a good bit of disagreement on exactly who he's referring to here. For instance, A.T. Robertson, the great Greek scholar, argued that, quote, these little ones in verse 10, see that that you do not despise these little ones, that here he's actually speaking of either little children or children of faith. He's either continuing the object lesson of the actual child, or he has now shifted to say, hey, don't despise the humble, simple Christian. Um, Others argue that these little ones... Uh, Frederick Bruner argues, weirdly in my opinion, that it's referring to those who are on the fence, who are half in and half out, the the struggling Christian. I don't think that lends itself correctly to that personally. Others argue that these little ones are not really little ones or insignificant persons, but those considered to be little and insignificant by others. Don't look down on those who are considered to be insignificant. Others argue that they are the socially unattractive or the spiritually unstrategic. And again, others argue that these are little children. I'm going to cautiously propose that he's talking here about humble Christians, which includes children. If that is what's happening here, he is saying do not look down on the humble Christian in the way that he has just corrected them for looking down on the child. The whole point of the child Become like this child or you want to enter the kingdom of heaven was to correct their cultural assumption that children were insignificant. Now he's saying, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. And I will remind you that John in 1 John refers to Christians as little children seven times. And we find this elsewhere in the New Testament as well. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. One of the first jobs I ever had in church, it wasn't the very first, like job jobs, was I was a student minister at a church, and I was only going to be there for six months. It was right before I got married. I had a little six-month window where I went back home between graduating college and uh, getting uh, getting married. And uh, they, when I first went there, they had pre-planned for the youth group to go to this youth rally at another town, like a neighboring town. So this was pre-planned. I inherited this trip, which was absolutely fine. I mean, that was great. I didn't have to do any work on it, so I just went. So we went, and these kids from another church got up and sang, and uh, were doing a worship song. And I got to be honest, it was pretty rough. It wasn't great, but they seemed to, to really be pouring themselves into it. They were trying to do a concert. It did not go well. When I got back in the van with the youth group that I was technically the interim leader of, but really there were lay leaders who had been with them for a long time, they began to deride and mock these other young people who had been trying to do this, laughing at them. And I remember I didn't say anything. I didn't chastise them. I was fairly new there. I was just quiet. And one of the lay leaders looked at me and said, I'll never forget this. said, look at Wyman. He's quiet. He must have actually enjoyed that and started laughing. And I said, well, no, I'm just of the opinion that it's a little inappropriate to laugh at people who are sincerely worshiping. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Don't look down on the small church. Don't look down on the sincere believer who's trying his best. You ever heard someone sing a song anywhere in church or some church? It's technically not great, but you can tell they really love Jesus. Which would you prefer, that or the really polished singer who seems a million miles away? Sad reality is a lot of people take the polished singer. Do you want the show that's well constructed or do you want sincerity? See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Do not look down on the humble Christian. In fact, 
according to Jesus, we should all strive to be humble Christians. That's what we should strive to be, to be stripped of pretension, to simply stand before the Lord with sincerity, to encourage one another in the faith. Do not despise one of these little ones. And then the second part of the verse, for I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven, which is a proof text normally used to defend the idea of guardian angels. We can talk about that in the discussion time. I have no objection to that, by the way. It seems to be what it's saying. The only thing I would say is this. If here in verse 10, he's not merely speaking of biological children, if he's now expanded that to refer to all Christians are little children, what it means then isn't that little children have a guardian angel, but we all do forever, right? Now, I think we need to be careful with that. But the idea that we have an angel, look, look what it says. I tell you that in heaven, their angels, that language, always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Mike, what this means is you may have your very own angel. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. You're grateful for that. But look at what? Look at what? Look at verse Matthew 18, 10, 18, 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones which we've already argued is probably a reference to Christians in general, humble Christians, and not merely to children. He's now launching off of the object lesson that he painted earlier in Matthew 18 and is applying the truth. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, what's interesting about that is we might want it to say, because I tell you that their angels always see their face. But the comfort is in the fact, if you read it, that their angels see the face of my father. The angels who are messengers of God stand before God on behalf of those for whom they are guardian angels. We are looking at Matthew 18, 10 uh, through 14, Matthew 18, 10 through 14. So see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Do not look down on the humble Christian For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. The idea of guardian angels is suggested here. By the way, it was very much picked up and run with in early Jewish literature, like rabbinic literature. For instance, um, in the story of Jacob, we know Jacob had angelic uh, protection, one of, the, one of the early Jewish writings says this. This is outside of Scripture. I'm just telling you that it's in the tradition of the Jews that we have guardian angels. Quote, so the angel said to Jacob, do not fear, O Jacob. I am the angel who has been walking with you and guarding you from your infancy. So this is a very ancient tradition. You probably find it reflected here in Matthew 18.10 as well. I remember when Hannah was a little girl, occasionally she would get scared in her room and she would say, I'm scared. Come in and, you know, wake us up. I'm scared. So I'd go in there and sit on the edge of her bed and I'd say, right now, standing at the foot of your bed, it's a great, swarthy, muscular angel with a huge flaming sword. And the devil is terrified of that angel. It looked like Phil Capel. That angel. Yeah. Maybe not as... T- Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. <laughs> Robbie, she laughing too much. Yeah, Robbie, don't laugh. That's not that funny. Is no, but uh, but no. This beautiful idea that that and it is. It's a very comforting idea, isn't it? That we have angelic protection. Now, the idea of a guardian angel should not be synonymous with exclusively a guardian angel, like the whole host of heaven rides up to defend the children of God. But that's a beautiful thought. So first of all, do not look down on the humble Christian. Secondly, God loves his little children. God loves his little children. Now, again, I'm arguing that little children in this portion of Matthew 18 is referring to all of us. The way John refers to us as little children all throughout 1 John. <clears throat> but this is how he This is how he argues for the value of God's little children. Verse 12. What do you think? I like this. Jesus invites you into a thought experiment. Isn't that fun? What do you think? 
if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Jesus does not preference the mass to the exclusion of the lowly. Well, I got most of you here. <laughs> no, Jesus will not let you slip through his fingers. That one little sheep is very valuable to Jesus. I think, I think personally, Thomas, that this drives missions. Um, I think about, and everyone in here has been on, probably, probably lots of you have been on mission trips, and, and so you can fill in the blank with your own memories, you know, but you, you go somewhere like Honduras, um, Lewis, been over in Africa a lot, probably more than you ever thought you would be. Go, go to places that the world looks at and says those are four places or whatever. You go, I, I think of, uh, I think of walking the path up to this, two or three of us, one of these trips went up and there was a child who was severely mentally disabled that they had tied around the waist, and he was not tied to this. He, he had room. I think they were generally trying to be helpful, but he was thrashing about violently. He was tied around the waist with a rope that was tied to the beam in the house, a wood beam. So he could move around the house, but he couldn't get away. And I remember standing in that house looking at this man, just impoverished dirt floor, kid tied with a roof, rope again seemingly the parents explaining it he will hurt himself if he gets away i mean i had no judgment on that what do you do with that you know what right now if that if that person is still with us that person is the most valuable person in the kingdom i mean truly is just stop and think about that does god love the celebrity tv pastor more than that child mentally ill, tied in a mud hut on top of some hill. Nope, nope, God does not. In fact, not saying he loves the pastor less, but I'm saying the heart of God, the heartbeat of the gospel seems to be that he's near that child. If, if you were to find Jesus sitting somewhere, he's going to be sitting on that mud floor more than in that jet airplane, Right? What the world calls insignificant, God calls significant. What do you think? I love that. That's not a throwaway line. It's also not a transition. It's also not a mere invitation to consideration. It's a question about where's our head? What do you think? If a guy has 100 sheep and one of them goes missing, is he going to leave the 99 and go get the one? Yeah. And then he's going to celebrate. That question is haunting. What do you think? When you see the lowly, the, quote, little child in the kingdom, the humble, the, quote, simple, whatever that is, do you feel a kind of superiority to that person? We dare not. What do you think? Notice the response ultimately in verse 13. If he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. God deeply loves his wayward sheep. You've heard enough sermons about sheep to know that people always say sheep are dumb animals, you know. There's a uh, video circulating that goes around online. I don't know if you've seen it. The, the girl, I think it's a lady who pulled the sheep has fallen down in this crack in the earth. You seen this? Grabs her by the back leg, pulls the sheep out. The sheep goes boom, 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 it goes right back into the crack of the, you just see him. And I, I showed it to Ronnie. I said, that's the whole old Testament. <laughs> that's the whole old Testament and the new Testament. And she said, and that's you. I said, well, it kind of is. Kind of is. That's just life. Don't despise that person. What do you think? And then the final note in verse 14, God will save his children. It's not just that the, the humble Christian has value and the humble Christian is loved. It's also that the humble Christian 
is the object of God's saving work. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God's love will not let his children perish. The Southern Baptist Convention, uh, what used to be called the Annuity Board, now it's called Guidestone, it's the Annuity Board, has something called um, Operation Dignity, which, uh, again, Thomas, one of these days I really think we should probably, every time I see the videos on this, I think our church should probably be involved in this. It's really amazing. Operation Dignity, that's the name of it, I think, right? Operation Dignity is a fund that you can give, like I could give you the information, you could give to it. It's a fund to help usually the widows of usually small church pastors who were not able to have retirement to help them have a a sustainable level of living. And the videos at the convention are just heartbreaking. It's it's your grandma on that screen (laughs) saying, thank you, Operation Dignity. And it's legit. I mean, they have helped. There are tons of usually widows receiving little checks that are helping them buy groceries. And every time I look at that, you know, I think we need to put that in our budget. We probably need to put that in our budget, which I think we probably need to put that in our church budget and help, help with this. Make some, or, or a lot of churches have like an Operation Dignity Sunday or something like that or whatever, um, or GCF or whatever. But every time I look at that, I think, wow, these sweet people in these little churches – And I I keep trying to catch myself and say, there are no little churches. There really aren't. There are no little pastors' wives. There are no little pastors. There are big pastors. There's not a lot of little ones. Because there's value in it. You take the countryest of country little churches with 15 people in it, and a pastor and his wife who love Jesus, and the church loves Jesus, and they're gathering together and singing the hymns and praying. There's deep, deep value in that. I'm really scared of this language that I started off with, these examples of high-impact leader, large church pastors said as a kind of this person's more important than that person. This language is very dangerous. If God will leave the 90 and the 9 to save his little children, then that means that little child is as valuable as anyone else. And in fact, he rejoices more over that than the others. Do not despise the kingdom where Jesus said the entry point is becoming like a child. Do not despise the kingdom where greatness is defined as a mustard seed. Don't despise the little, the small. Francis Schaeffer Uh, passed away in 1984, I think. It was in the mid-80s. And uh, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book called No Little People, which he meant everyone has significance, everyone has value. No one is tiny, unimportant, or should be cast off. See to it that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of, of my father who is in heaven. So it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.